honored to welcome Ashish Dhawan, founder of Central Sketch Foundation, and Madhav Chavan, founder of Pratham, is also a partner at the Nad Center for Social Innovation, uh, who will lead their respective talks on the state of education in India, followed by a fireside chat with Smarita Shetty, co-founder of India Development Review. Ashish and Madhav have spent decades working on the India's education systems, public and private, and have analyzed the strengths and vulnerabilities of the system, more recently those surfaced by the pandemic. In this chat, they will highlight the opportunities to strengthen these systems as well as what's needed to achieve inclusive and equitable education for all. Very warm welcome to all of you. Over to Smarinita for the next hour. Thank you. Thank you, Santosh. Uh, good morning, everyone, and a very happy Independence Day to you all. Uh, this is the uh, opening plenary of the India section of uh, the forum that's been organi organized over a 24-hour period, and the discourse is all about development. Um, most of you in India, um, you know, tuning in, it's a relatively early start for you all, especially given that it's a Saturday. So thank you for making the time. Um, this panel uh, is going to be on the state of education in India. And the reason we are starting uh, the day with this is because in India, education, quality education is seen as a silver bullet, right? One that can change uh, the life of a child and you know, therefore her family as well. Um, and therefore, this panel is going to have like Ashish and Madhav speak about you know, what, you know, where are we today, what are the opportunities. Uh, the reason this discussion is also particularly important at this point in time is basically threefold. One is because we just have 10 years left for the Sustainable Development Goals and SDG 4, which is all about education, is uh, primarily about getting all our children, right, boys and girls, to achieve primary and secondary schooling by then. Secondly, India has launched uh, its national education policy after a gap of 34 years. This is a very ambitious policy and even if we can get uh, a big chunk of it done is going to transform the way education happens you know, for our children and for the generations that come. But most importantly, uh, which is the third reason, is that we're all in the midst of this pandemic. And it has fundamentally changed the world, right? But it is the biggest impact has, in a sense, been on uh, you know, children's education. So we are being forced to think of new ways to kind of reach them. You know, how do we teach them? Also to make sure that no child is left behind. Uh, so given this urgency and given the sense um, of, you know, that we have to do things now and to understand some of these factors, we have uh, Ashish, uh, who's the uh, founder and chairperson of Central Square Foundation, as well as uh, the founding member of Ashoka University, and Madhav, who's the founder and the a former CEO of Pratham, which is one of the largest, um, you know, nonprofits in India, both on the education as well as the skilling front, speak to us. Um, in a sense, they don't need a bigger introduction because literally when you say education in India, these are probably the first two names that come to mind. So I am going to hand over um, the mic in a sense to them. Uh, so maybe Madhav, we can start with you. Maybe you can do, uh, you know, address the audience for the first 15 minutes, followed by Ashish, and then we can do a you know, Q&A and a fireside chat. Thank you. You're on mute, Madhav. I think you're on mute. Oh, okay, I didn't know I could unmute myself. Uh, so thank you, Smaranita. Uh, talking about state of education today is extremely difficult because today is a time of such uncertainty. Uh, and what if you say what was the state of education in February 2020, that would have been one thing. But now talking about state of education as, as it exists today, it basically says zero. <laughs> it's all schools are closed and the process of education, process of transferring knowledge and skills to the next generation has all but come to a standstill. And the worst part is we don't know when this is going to end and how it's going to uh, pan out afterwards. People uh, casually when they talk, they say when all this is over, and we don't know really what we mean by all this is over and when that will be. Uh, when the pandemic started and everything started shutting down, uh, there was a tendency to use the words, uh, the phrase new normal. I somehow, maybe I don't talk to many people, but I don't seem to hear the phrase new normal anymore. People have gotten tired of whatever this new normal was. And I'm not sure there is such a thing as a new normal. I think everybody's dying to get back to what it used to be 
where you could get together, go to the restaurant, go for a drive or go for a walk and meet people and, you know, shake hands and hug and so on and so forth. And the new normal of sitting at home, working from home, learn, learning at home is getting a bit too tiresome. And of course, there are other, other issues involved with it. But let's say, let's talk about uh, the state of education that has existed and what it was, its challenges were. And now, as you pointed out, with the new education policy, uh, we have reached a point where we've shown, we've expressed some aspirations of where we want our country to be uh, based on certain assumptions as to where the whole country is going to be. Education-wise, we know that we want to do X, Y, and Z. But uh, is that going to be relevant uh, after all this is over, as, as you would say? Because uh, ultimately, uh, education, its goals are dependent on basically two broad themes. One is the theme of social justice, you know, equitable, equal, and so on and so forth. That is the uh, social justice theme. And the other one is when you talk about quality of education and so on, its relevance to the economy. What does the Indian economy need? What kind of workforce does the Indian economy need? If you to put those two things together, and these are broad uh, national sort of uh, goals, but at the same time, you would see uh, from a family point of view or individual point of view, these can be translated differently. Uh, you'd say, I want my child to be to grow up to be a responsible and good citizen, a good person. That's a very social kind of goal. And the other is, I want my child to be able to fend for himself, herself, uh, should be able to get a job, should be able to earn a living, livelihood with some sense of dignity. So if you look at it, it's a, it's a two by two kind of matrix where, where there is an individual goal and there is a, a national goal. There is a social goal and there's an economic goal. And the education system, whether it is expressed that way or not, actually has to navigate the space uh, around these four boxes. Uh, and, and then you have to say whether we have succeeded or we are succeeding in uh, fulfilling the aspirations, uh, family-wise, individual-wise, or a national. Um, there's a tendency to think that uh, a lot has happened only in the last 20, 30 years. You see, uh, it's true that a lot has happened in the last 20, 30 years, especially after the economic liberalization of India and after the turn of the millennium. Um, but if you look at the numbers, it will tell you that by 2000, the gross enrollment ratio for primary education in India, uh, number of children in primary schools against the number of uh, children in that uh, I don't know, that gross will not be that number of, anyway. So the enrollment ratio at that time, at about 2000, year 2000, had already reached about 95% for primary education. Uh, how did we get there? Without, without any special economic provisions and so on and so forth, without the Right to Education Act? Now that's a good question to ask. When we, Pratham was founded 25 years ago, uh, we were, we started with a belief, and that's why our motto is every child in school and learning well. We have not let go of every child in school, which is going to come handy now. But at that time, the belief was, and I say belief because numbers, statistics, data was not easily available as it is available now. Both the private and the government systems of data have improved remarkably over the last 15, 20 years. And I'm happy to say that we have contributed to that a lot. So numbers were not available and the belief was that most children are not in school or a lot of children are not in school. But it turns out that the school system had catered to uh, children in the primary education stage a lot. And this happened for two reasons. One is the states which were uh, responsible for providing education. Uh, it was a concurrent subject, but mostly the responsibility lay with the states. The states did provide education for the primary age uh, to the extent they could. Um, and, and also the important thing, I think, is there was a growing uh, sense of need and demand on the part of families and people. There was a social demand for education, which was latent. It was not, it was not apparent to everybody as it is now today, but uh, it was there. 
But around 2000, the problem was that the gross enrollment ratio at the secondary stage, at the next stage beyond primary, was around 45%. And I think this is something that has significantly changed in the last 20 years. Uh, children going from four, fourth, fifth grade upwards to eighth grade has uh, now reached about uh, nearly 100%. Everybody who's completing primary education has gone to uh, secondary education. And the rate of completing 10th grade examination has also grown up, uh, has grown. Now, what this is saying is the access to schooling, and I use the word schooling very deliberately, is uh, that is to, to, to go to a school to participate in what is going on in the classroom. Uh, that access to educational process has increased dramatically. Uh, but as we keep saying, uh, schooling is not learning. And so there, is, there are the other problems, and we've said this again and again and again, and it can get boring to, to some people, that while children go to school, their learning uh, is a problem. And when you look at learning, so it's not that some children are not learning, some children are learning something, something. Uh, to participate in the growing economy, there is a certain percentage of the Indian population, and which is a privileged population which is able to participate in the economy fully. And you can look at it from different points of view. The total number, a percentage of Indian population that actually takes home a regular salary. What is that percentage of, of the population? I don't think it is more than about 15%. It's probably less than that, 12%. So you are looking at a secure living of uh, not more than 12 to 13% people uh, participating fully in the economy and that and the in the pandemic has again dropped a lot uh, so then at the end of the education process whenever that ends uh, to, for a lot of people the education process ends around 12th standard where right now today and the new education policy is saying we want to take it to 100 percent that may be true but even after completing 12 years of schooling and now it's going to be 14 because the, in the preschool time, where they've added a couple of years, uh, including you know the change in the pattern from five, three, three, four, or whatever. So after completing that process, and I use the word completing somewhat deliberately, because what will happen is after you complete your twelfth standard, if you're, uh, you you may continue to to a gra to undergraduate studies and a graduate degree or a diploma. But essentially, that's when your education process stops. And after that, if you say, is the economy going to provide me a space? The answer is probably not. Is the economy going to change? And these questions have to be answered. Uh, the new education policy, and I don't know how much time I have, the new education policy has already set goals to do certain big things, and which is a very welcome change in policy uh, as it's, when it's get, when it, and you have to see when it gets implemented. Uh, there are going to be a lot of constraints given the state of the economy today. Uh, some very fu fundamental things have been proposed. One is that by the third grade uh, or in the primary stage at any rate, children should know their fundamentals of literacy and numeracy and foundational skills. That's a very welcome change. This is something that we've been fighting for for the last 15 years, publishing numbers and saying, look, Children are going to school, but they're not learning the foundation. So that's a very welcome change. That's not just an opportunity, uh, but it's, it's a, a very critical need. If you don't get children to come to that point, then future opportunities are, are cut. And, and the purpose of education is mainly, mainly to create those opportunities. Whether you can, the economy gives them steady jobs or not, that's a completely different thing. But even for, to fend for themselves, to uh, earn some livelihood, to become contributors and participants in the economy, you need certain basic skills. And if that is not available, then the education process is not, not going to be useful. It's not about the years of education that you go through. It, it has some relevance, but it's not just that. Then the second thing that the uh, new policy has proposed, which is a very significant change, is that to build this foundation at the primary stage, you need to start at the early childhood education stage which was talked about a lot in the, in the previous uh, you know, debates and discussions on policy and implementation and laws of education and all that, but never actually given serious uh, consideration to. Uh, now, I think 
uh, for the first time, the government has actually said, practically speaking, that you must start um, uh, education process, uh, and not not formally speaking, but actually include the preschool years as a part of the primary stage of learning. So th that is a very significant change, and 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 I'm glad that it is not about just the cursive writing and the reading of alphabets and numbers. Some serious thought has been given. Uh, by including some very good uh, educationists in the early childhood education space. And we have that, that addition to the policy. Now, these two things are important. And the higher education side, I'm sure Ashish will talk about both things after me. Uh, but the, the, the thing that is important, and that is uh, uh, the thing that is going to be important in the post-pandemic part, is that uh, people will need the freedom to learn. The, the provisions of the new policy that you should be able to enter and exit as you please. You should be able to create your own uh, uh, learning patterns. Uh, there should be freedom for, for people to set up uh, institutions and certify and so on. Now, all this is really important because the, the, the time that is now ahead of us, and not only because of the pandemic, is that and then because, mainly because of the technology uh, that is making a big difference is that there's the, the process of education, process of acquiring knowledge. Uh, I mean, these two are slightly different. This need not be linear as it has been for the last 200 years. And in India, let's say 100 years. Uh, linear as in, you know, you start in grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, then that, the, 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 the curriculum and the syllabus is also linear. You learn this in grade two, then this in three, and then this is four. Now, uh, with the uh, availability of technology, and true, it's unequal uh, availability right now. But with the available technology and the, te the availability, the access to technology is going to keep on growing. If you look at that, then the possibility of accessing knowledge non-linearly, it becomes very possible. Uh, uh, I was speaking with uh, Nanda Nilekane. Uh, a few months ago, before the pandemic, we were recording his interview, and he said it uh, nicely. He said there was a time when we created schools. I can't exactly quote him, but there was a time when we created schools, and that was the important part where the masses started going for education. And then the time came when institutions were set up, and I asked him, "So, these is the time of institutions over or not? Because now institutions have barriers." You can come to my campus, you can come and work in my uh, university, you can study here only if I allow you to, if you cross these barriers and I give you. But technology says I can listen to lectures of Harvard professors and Stanford professors wherever I'm sitting. So why should I have this barrier of enrollment? It's, it's all linked to certification. If you get certified by a university, then you are a graduate of that university. If you belong to a university, you belong to a club. Uh, that you know, so 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 your peers. Oh, you are from this university. You are from that university. That identifies you as a person, as to who you are. Now that is in the in the current time, it's going to be difficult. We know in 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 in, in Delhi, for example, I keep hearing cutoff point is ninety nine point five percent. I mean, nothing can be more ridiculous that you you get ninety nine point five percent marks and then you are allowed to enter a certain school or college. I think the future now has to be barrier free education and we have to move towards that barrier free education the process of learning where people can uh, transfer what they know to you has to become barrier free it can it it, it need not be only institutional uh, and it may be scary to think of all education or a lot of education becoming informal but that is something we are learning in the time of the pandemic i don't know how long this is going to continue but what suddenly has happened is what were all formal processes of learning have become informal. And we see even among the underprivileged in the, in the villages and so on, what we find is that the parents, earlier parents were not a part of the learning process. And today as the, as the schools remain closed, uh, the education departments are also saying that you need to uh, bring the parents in, especially for younger children, parents are coming in. For uh, a lot of people, instead of becoming parts of the larger institutions of education, 
it may be more useful to become form small groups of education small and big and much bigger so there is a need to reorganize education i don't know how it's going to happen but i can see that there is a need to do that the technology factor is going to be important it will be helpful in reorganizing education um so there are a lot of challenges uh to to summarize i would say uh we are in in the middle of a pandemic true it will open up uh whether we go back to exactly the same situation that we were before depends upon how seriously we want to take education uh because the upper classes the privileged will actually have their educational process all worked out the problem is the 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 classes below and i'm not even saying the last 20% it's more like the 70% below the top 20 30% which are going to need uh more access to a quality education uh process uh, i think i've spoken a lot maybe i should stop there thank you thank you madhav uh, i think we'll touch upon some of the things at the in the fireside chat as well you know the role of technology uh, what will it take to kind of create barrier free education uh, but before that i'd like to hand over the you know floor in a sense or the room in a sense to uh, ashish ashish hi thanks very much um, so i thank you i think madhav has set the stage and uh, maybe what i'll do is focus on six key points i see with regards to school education and and three critical points with regards to higher education in the new education uh, policy um so i think starting with the uh, school education um i think madhav pointed out you know the most important reform here is with regards to foundational numeracy and literacy uh, we do have children going to school uh, 95 plus percent almost universal enrollment rates in uh, elementary school but having said that there is a learning crisis and i think the good news about this part is that the document calls out that this is the number one priority without it no other reform is important and the fact that by 2025 we need to have achieved significant progress on foundational numeracy and literacy so it's it's concrete and it wants to put it into mission mode uh, in fact there's talk um, the minister and the finance minister have already announced that a mission will be launched in december and will run for 5 years with concrete goals and hopefully unleashing the demand side earmarking budgets uh, and of, of course states eventually have to get behind this so i think that's point number 1 a new energy and a mission for foundational numeracy and literacy which is absolutely critical for the country and if you look at there are many other countries around the world that have done this there's a program in south africa called funda wanda which is focused on reading there's bossa filipina in the philippines which was launched in 2013 by the way vietnam did this 20 years ago and this is why the vietnamese are so far ahead of us in terms of exports and as a knowledge economy and and has a much more vibrant uh, and and more just society i would argue apart from vibrant uh, economy china did this uh, 20 25 years ago and in the recent past kenya has launched the tusome program uh, peru the most improved country on pisa also had a strong focus on foundational numeracy and literacy so i think india finally has decided to do this and given that uh, 125 million children are enrolled in class 1 to 5 uh, you know the the numbers are significant 25 million children flow through every grade every year uh, and if we can get them to be literate and numerate uh, numerate this will be the single biggest achievement we would have made the second point is around uh, you know early education where of course it's the building block if we want to achieve the good news also about the first one is we don't require a lot of additional resources so i personally think the 6% is a pipe dream it's not going to happen anytime soon i mean just look at our tax to gdp it's not conceivable that we can take education up to 6% we don't have the fiscal space forget about the covid time when we are struggling even in the next 5 years it's not achievable let's talk about things that are achievable uh, the foundation numeracy literacy mission is achievable because the money required is small just needs to be earmarked we've actually done some analysis to show even if you earmark just the money available within ssa itself you can actually achieve a, a lot of this 
Uh, second is around the universalization of early education. Uh, there, uh, the policy calls for a pre-prep prep class in, uh, and, and I think it addresses the issue which uh, Asar points out, that in rural India, only 28% of children or 27% of children are going to Anganwadis. And uh, 50 plus percent of children are either in private schools or in government schools already. 21 states actually allow children to be admitted into class one at the age of five. And that is a, a tragedy because children are not ready to transact the grade one curriculum. They haven't had that prep year. Uh, and so if you look at most middle income countries, they actually do have uh, akin to our private system, which has a junior K and senior K, uh, they do have at least one pre-preparatory year in pre-primary year in the formal school system. Now this will take time to get rolled out. It'll also cost some money, but in the near term, if we can just reorganize our schools in a way where we prioritize certain schools, we co-locate Anganwadis, I think there's a way to start making progress on this. But I think to fully roll it out will still take five to seven years and, and there is an additional fiscal requirement here. I think the third one is around higher quality data. I think what Asar has always done is held a mirror to the system, provided data from the outside. It's a rural survey. I think the system has tried to strengthen uh, the NAS, but I think this idea, the National Achievement Survey, I think this idea of setting up a separate body, PARA, that not only works to you know, create a framework and works with uh, eventually with boards to, to create some degree of standardization of learning objectives, but more importantly, looks to strengthen the National Achievement Survey. So we get higher quality data you know, coming out of uh, here because uh, at the end of the day, the system will rely on this. The mission for foundational numeracy and literacy will rely on this data. So I think that's a third important uh, reform is strengthening our data system, and particularly with regards to learning, not just other data. I think a fourth one is around uh, the idea that whilst we do this mission, I think we can't ignore the fact that 47.5% of our children go to private schools. So I'm, I'm not a private school wala. All I'm saying is that we can't ignore this fact that almost one in two children are there. And so whatever the, the system wants to do, it does need to be cognizant of the fact children are there? How do we create the right incentives for these schools to, to improve? I think a fifth one uh, actually talks to some of these incentives, which is, I know a lot of people have criticized the idea of uh, having um, exams before class 10 and 12, because there's something mentioned in the policy around this idea of, which people are interpreting as a board exam in class three, five, eight. I look at it as, you know, a key stage exam. So there are many systems in the world Peru, Mexico, Chile, I mean, closer to home, uh, many other countries as well in Asia that have key stage exams. The UK is very famous for its key stage exams. And all it says is we want a low stakes census exam with some degree of fidelity. By the way, Indian state governments are already doing it, but they're, they're not doing a great job. The data is not very reliable. So if we had at the state level, even we picked one key stage, say class five at the end of primary school, and it's low stakes, but you had some high fidelity census data. It could then be used to measure how you know, schools are doing, and in particular, to send a signal to parents in terms of how private schools are doing. Because we feel that information provision is a key issue, or the asymmetry in information is a key issue with re regards to the lack of incentives for private schools to improve. And finally, I would say the issue of education technology, which we know that, uh, you know, right now ed tech is not a panacea for sure, but it needs to be integrated into teaching and learning. It, it uh, will be accessible at home as uh, smartphone penetration continues to increase. And I think the policy does talk about setting up a national education technology forum. Um, of course, a lot of innovation here will happen in the private sector through community organizations. But I think even the government even playing some shepherding role in terms of building evidence, running pilots uh, would be uh, useful. So overall, I think I'm, I'm quite positive on the policy. You look, it's a policy at the end of the day. It's a question of how we implement it. The good news is that with regards to foundational numeracy and literacy, it's, it's concrete in terms of timeline. 
I think alongside that will come this PARA, which is the assessment, it, 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 because we need the data for the mission. I think this key stage exam, even if we did class five, could come with the mission, because at the end of the day, every school, and particularly if we want uh, private schools to participate in the mission, we need to send some signal to parents uh, overall and to these schools that they need to perform. So I think there are several of these. ECE also, in a way, fits into the mission. So out of the, the six points that I made, actually four or five of them talk to this mission. And so to me, this is the, the most important one. And there's a, a concrete timeline, including some concrete goals. If you look at the World Bank's Learning Poverty Report, which aggregates NAS data, not our data, it's the systems data, about 55% of children by class five are learning poor. What that means is they can't read basic text at the end of class, at age 10 or class five. Uh, to put it in context, Sri Lanka is at 15% and China is sub 20%. So if we want to have some hope of being a middle income country, if we want to provide some degree of, you know, we want to reduce inequity or some degree of social justice in India, this has to be the single most important goal, taking that 55% down to 25 or 20% you know, in the next five, seven years. On higher ed, I would say there are three critical reforms. First is, I think the document clearly calls out that all of Indian higher education needs to move in the direction of being multidisciplinary and holistic. I think for too long, the system has been trapped in putting students into a straitjacket, silos, you know, anodyne learning, exams, uh, and basically, nothing really happens. For a lot of people who've been through higher ed in India, it's been a farce. Uh, and I think this idea, recognizing that the 21st century, most students don't need deep specialized knowledge, but actually uh, 21st century skills, critical thinking, the ability to communicate well, the ability to com connect the dots, some basic introduction to different disciplines and ways of thinking, uh, some you know, basic knowledge uh, so that they can build on that as knowledge is now accessible and keeps changing in the world around us. So this is the reason we set up Ashoka. And to me, I think the biggest validation of the Ashoka model is the fact that the system now wants to imbibe it uh, across all of higher ed. I think a second one is around credit transfer. I think this, this idea that, look, we'll have a lot of specialized institutions, but if I'm a student sitting at IIT, could I take the political science course offered by Ashoka online or by some other university, by St. Stephen's or Delhi University, uh, and include it in my portfolio and get credit for it, I think is a big game changer. And we'll have to ensure that it's delivered in a frictionless manner where the institutes don't decide which other institutions um, are credit worthy. But across a pool of any university in the top 100 can offer a course that's credit worthy and, and the other institutions shouldn't be able to stop it. So as long as it's a, a frictionless market, I think it will be a, a game changer. And a third one is around the National Research Foundation. I think all of Indian higher ed, I mean, the reason why we don't show up in these top 100, top 200 rankings is uh, there's only a modicum of research happening at our universities. Uh, and I think the National Research Foundation wants to prioritize a few areas. Uh, of course, in our system, we're still leaving a lot of the funding to departments, DST, DBT, other uh, sources. It's not aggregating it under one, but it's playing a coordinating role. And I think this is the role, if you look at the Venevar Bush plan in the U.S. post-war, World War II, uh, this is what stimulated the creation of the National Science Foundation, NIH, and supercharged research at U.S. universities. China has done the same in the last 15 years with their own equivalents. Uh, two separate bodies that China set up. So it's high time that India did this if we want to be a knowledge society, if we want to be a producer of knowledge and, and not just a consumer of knowledge. And I don't mean just in tech areas. I mean, of course, this is important in areas like AI or quantum computing or biotech. We'll just be left behind. But it's equally important in areas around research, around our own civilization or in the social sciences. You know, if Raj Chetty's work on real-time GDP uh, why couldn't we be doing this in, in India or for India? So I think there's cutting edge stuff we can do in, this, in the social sciences and the humanities as well. So I, I think there's big opportunities, but a lot will depend upon implementation. This is a guiding document 
I think the good news is in school edu education, at least foundational learning is called out in terms of timing and in terms of mission. So I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Ashish. And um, I think the, I mean, the way you laid out your talk actually segues well into you know, what was going to be my first question, because you actually said these are the you know, five things and three things that we should like focus on, and this is what we should put our emphasis on. But the education sector, in a sense, has like a range of stakeholders, right? I mean, from the government to private school players to, uh, you know, educationists, teachers, children, parents. So if you had to look at like, I mean, if you had to pick, say, the three or four like large stakeholders in the space and you know, the change that they can drive, how should they be prioritizing this, right? So what should like the first two things the government should be prioritizing? Similarly, you know, what should be stuff that like, you know, the, the way the private school system works, how should they be thinking about it, right? Private school players. So both if uh, Madha, then maybe Ashish could speak to it. What in your heads, if we, because we are a resource constrained, you know, uh, a country in a sense, plus uh, there's so much to be done in so little time, if you had to prioritize, uh, maybe first top three stakeholders, what would they have to prioritize? Uh, Who's going first? Ashish? <laughs> Madhav, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, uh, in a way, the policy has set the priorities, uh, and, and Ashish mentioned that. Uh, in fact, there is a passage in the policy that says that if you don't achieve the universal uh, foundational numeracy and literacy, then everything else is going to be lost. So clearly, that is one priority uh, and the topmost priority, and for which the, everything else should be uh, geared. But uh, I think the way we think of priorities has to change. Uh, if you say the priority of the government, uh, then what happens is you're looking at one person who says, look, I can't do 10 things, I'll do one thing. But don't forget, this is a huge system. It exists in far away places. Once upon a time in the little village, there was uh, no education worth talking about. And now you see today, that uh, kids coming from small villages are also now shining in the sort of board exams, whatever their worth is, or becoming, you know, IAS officers and so on. This is, this is a spread. It's almost like cricket. Once upon a time, all cricketers came from a little piece of Mumbai. And now they are from far flung places and they are the heroes of India. So the, the, that, that, that it is spread and it's all over the place. Now, and everybody who's holding a post somewhere in education has to decide that this is what I want to do, that I must improve the quality of learning and the process of education much higher. That is easy to do. There are different departments that must say, strive for uh, a better performance and excellence. And this is something that uh, you can look at the policy and say, this is what I need to do. And they need to have the freedom to do that. You can't have everything centralized and only one person decides what to do. That is exactly the wrong thing to do because that, you know, brings out all priorities to what a one person can do. But now, if you say that everybody has to make sure that we are going to achieve these goals, then uh, charting your path is possible. Since you talked about all the stakeholders. Yeah. Ashish? So, Smarnita, I'll, I'll maybe you said three or four stakeholders. I'll point out like four key ones. I think firstly, um, let's start with government. Uh, if we take something like the national mission, I think what we need is the prime minister to fully get behind it, to use uh, his offices to actually send out a message to the country uh, that this is in mission mode, it's absolutely critical to define what we want to achieve. Uh, and so from the center, there are a number of things we can do in terms of ensuring the budgets are there, the communication and, and unlocking the demand side, getting districts to compete with each other as we did in uh, many other programs. So unlocking the demand side and defining some guidelines, I think is at, this, at the center. Um, and I think the center is doing that. So a lot of credit to them to putting this into mission mode. Um, and I think the prime minister is squarely behind this. So I think we will see uh, the prime minister actually lead from the frontier. Uh, I think as, in, as far as government is concerned, the state are key actors because really education implementation is under their control. And so there it's about energizing the departments. They need to do their own analysis. They need to set their own goals. Uh, they need to make this a priority, this foundational numeracy and literacy, and then get the district 
folks and block folks excited about this. It's a whole change, change management exercise within the system. So if districts are going to compete with each other, each block, each block education officer who typically will control about 150 schools needs to feel like they need to improve their unit. We need to have data uh, as well, but you know, energize the whole system. So that's one key set of stakeholders. Uh, a second is uh, teachers, of course. You know, no, uh, all of this will fail if there's no change in the classroom. I mean, we can get uh, everybody behind this, chief ministers, I mean, UP for instance, the chief minister uh, has put his hand on a document and sworn that he will deliver against Mission Prerna, which is their primary school program. And I think that's fantastic. We need more CMs doing it. But eventually, uh, if we, the teachers don't see this as, I mean, if we don't celebrate what the teachers are doing, we don't motivate them. And by the way, most teachers want to do good. We don't support them. They aren't aligned with what the broad goals are and understand them. Uh, we're not going to succeed. Uh, I always say when I went to visit Peru to see what's going on, because most improved country on PISA, it's interesting that every teacher understood what the goals were in class two and three. And it'd been announced by the, the president of the country, in this case, say a chief minister of the state. And so fantastic alignment and motivation were, was there. A third set of key stakeholders uh, are obviously the, the CSOs, the, the nonprofits. Um, I think they thus far have done great work in demonstrating you know, that you can achieve this. I mean, take Pratham's work or Room to Read or Dheer Chingran at LLF or so many other organizations who have shown that you can actually turn the needle. Uh, and I think getting them to be critical players in this mission, to say, instead of just running my own program, I'm going to support state governments as technical partners in, in terms of helping do the capacity building, also quality assuring it to ensure that the last, this is reaching out to the last mile and actual change is taking place in the classroom. I think we need all the civil society actors to get aligned and particularly some of the key ones who have years of experience you know, in delivering high quality programs, but playing a somewhat different role, less programmatic, but more supporting uh, the system. And a fourth, the most critical stakeholders are the children and the parents themselves. I, I think the, for too long, we've ignored the community. And I think we can embrace the community, get parents to understand what the, their children need to achieve, what their role is, that learning can also happen in the home outside of school. Uh, and for, so I think these are the four key stakeholders. And I, I think if we can motivate these four stakeholders and, and find the appropriate roles uh, for them, uh, we have a shot at really seeing some change in the next five years. Thanks, thanks Ashish. Uh, and uh, uh, Madhav, I think, uh, I mean, I wanted, you spoke about barrier-free education, you know, as you spoke initially. And we also, I wanted to ask you about that. And we also have a question from Shraddha. And she, she's asking, how do we make education barrier free when there are thousands and lakhs vying for a few seats, right? There is, there's that aspect of it, but also the aspect of there are uh, economic, social, you know, gender barriers in, in India, right? That kind of prohibit, uh, prohibit a lot of things, right? That, or like, or that, like allow for different differential access in a sense to many things, right? And education is one of them. So how do we think about making this barrier free? Uh, I think when you spoke about it, it was from a, how can technology enable it, but there might be other things you know, at play as well, right? So if you could speak to you know, what some of those. I, I don't think I have a formula for how to make it barrier free. I think everybody knows, everybody feels that there are too many barriers. If I want to do something, I can't do it. And, and somehow these institutional barriers are boxing me in. But let's take an example. Uh, I mean, uh, if you're looking at the uh, information technology industry or even the communication industry, I don't think where you got your degree from or whether you got a degree from at all makes a difference. Because the employers or whoever is actually looking at the work you do and how it is done. Uh, so there is an example there that uh, the universities and the institutions don't actually make a difference. If you are able to do certain things, the, the things that you want to learn are available online. You can learn from peers, you can learn from uh, other people. So that's possible. Now, let's suppose if I say, you're talking about commerce education, whatever, 15, 17% of Indian students go for commerce education. And I, actually you come out not knowing much because every, people are just giving you textbooks. 
but suppose if different you know CAs and accountants were suppose were allowed to help students learn simple accounting, and if you had a course like now the new education policy allows you to go for a one year course or you know say that I want, why would that not be possible? Why do I have to go to a college or a university to learn accounting? I can learn it here. Why should that not be possible? There are some fields where this barrier will exist for some time to come. In the olden days, when there were no universities and colleges, there were people, practitioners who were training others. And I'm not saying it's entirely possible to do exactly like that. But now look, what has changed is once upon a time, which is like 50, 70 years ago, India's literacy rate was very low. Today, we are approaching 80% literacy. By the way, that is what China was in 1992. Now, so there are more educated people in the country and these educated people actually can transfer what they know to other people. This is possible. They're, they're doing it as tutors and so on and so forth. So now the only thing that remains is examination and certification. Now, even there, the reality is changing dramatically. If I, we train people in vocational skills and what we find is that employers start looking for people who say, okay, I'm ready to learn because most of the country actually learns on the job. Vocational skills are not learned in, in formally, uh, not learned formally in institutional processes. So when, when you want a good plumber, what do you want? What, what do you do? Are you looking for, maybe you look for an app now. But actually, the way you go is you ask people, do you know a good plumber? Can I can you recommend somebody? All this recommendation business is also happening. So the way we certify, the way we assess is outdated today. If you change that, the barriers will come down. So if I know accounting, I should have a, like you take a GMAT, like you take a GRE. It's there. There's a standardized examination. If I take that examination, it means something. And that allows me to get admission in the universities overseas. Why can't there be a simple accounting? Uh, I'm not stuck on accounting, looks like. <laughs> but on any other skills, there could be simple examinations that I should be able to take any time. Now, that technology for that is available. I think we need to start doing that. That's already happening. People are hiring. Nobody, I don't think anybody is really looking at your certificates and what good your degree is and so on. They are looking at what you know. And, and, and in a small, as I said, you know, this is a, the employment market, the salaried job formal market is really small. And in the larger economy, people are finding their livelihoods, not based on the degree that they earn, but what they know and, and how, how they come about, how they organize, how they think. So this is, this is already happening. It's a question of saying, recognizing it and say, okay, there are no barriers and you are allowed to learn, allowed to earn a certificate and move forward. It's possible to do. It's a matter of employers will have to first of all decide that I'm not necessarily going to ask for a degree certificate. Once you're over that, you're fine. Yeah, I think it's interesting you're saying that, right? Like uh, the frame of reference when people talk is always about jobs, whereas it's like more than 95%, you know, of like work is beyond formal jobs. And uh, I think applying that mindset is um, an important way when we think about, you know, whether it's like the knowledge we acquire or the certificates we need. But the other important point you also made is about employers having to change their mindsets about what is important, right? Uh, you, know, you know, graduates from a particular kind of school or university or like the skills they have. And maybe there's some work to be done on that. There was another question. I'm just going to jump into questions from the audience just because there seem to be quite a few. Uh, one of them is um, how do we... Um, Sorry, it's like, how do we make funding models available so that higher education is access is more accessible? Maybe Ashish, you could speak to that. Uh, so I think uh, higher education by and large um, is accessible if we're looking at it from a money standpoint. Uh, you know, the government institutions where about a third of the students go are heavily subsidized. Frankly, they should be charging more uh, than what they do. Uh, because it, you know, uh, I mean, they're very heavily subsidized. Um, and uh, with private institutions, I think the vast majority are not research universities. And so they're priced, I mean, they're very, there's a market out there. And so they price so that supply matches demand. Uh, it's only a few, I mean, even though Ashoka is a nonprofit university, 
we still have to price high and we still lose money because we're a research university. I think it's important to, to realize that firstly, you know, we're at 26% GER. I know the document talks about getting up to, you know, 50% eventually. Uh, to me, the more important goal as opposed to massification of higher ed, uh, because I think as Madhav said, is it really critical that 50% of students, you know, go to college? Or is it more important that they come out with certain skills, competencies, certification that can, you know, get them a job? Uh, I do think the policy at least addresses part of this with these pathways, one year, two year particularly. But I think we have to look at our higher ed system really the way, you know, this Carnegie classification that came up 50 years ago. I think all higher ed institutions are not the same. There are research universities at the top of the pyramid that produce knowledge, have PhD programs, the top students, you know, IITs and other places like that go there. They'll be future leaders for the country. And out of the 40 million students in higher ed, maybe a, at max half a million or a million will be there. You know, then you have the next five, 10 million, which is really the technical institutions. And then everything else is pretty much vocational. And we have to just formalize vocational, get this one, two year track, um, or just do it purely online. I think some model, by the way, of online, assisted online will work at scale. I think synchronous, is non-scalable, right? And that's the mode in which we do physical is synchronous. And doing synchronous online, people are doing it right now because they're forced to do it because of COVID. But it's non-scalable. It's obviously engaging if you do it well, uh, and in up to a minimal, up to a certain cohort size. Asynchronous, the problem we've seen with MOOCs is that dropout rates are very high. Now, when you get into the four credit market, obviously it will be better, the, the continuing rates, but People do need support. Uh, and so I think some halfway house of figuring out a course facilitator, which doesn't have to be a professor, on top of a asynchronous course, right? And some higher fidelity around the assignments and assessments. I don't think we're fully there. Uh, but, but I think the raw ingredients are in place. Uh, and some of what we've done early on with NPTEL and SWAM, you know, we've made some progress, but I think there's a long ways to go if we have to get it right. But there is an architecture we can get right, you know, in the near future. And by the way, for-profit companies are doing it ahead of some of the not-for-profit or government actors. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the, uh, you know, uh, attendees, uh, SK Sharma actually had this question saying, how do you make education inclusive for poor students? And I think you've addressed some of that. If there is assisted, uh, you know, uh, technology, because I think the big fear is, and we're seeing it now play out during the pandemic is, as you use more and more technology in the current situation, can it you know, broaden the digital divide? Right now you Perfect. have the digital haves and the digital have nots. Um, so how do you kind of, I mean, so some of the things you said is, it'll take some time to get there, but like what are some of the things that we have to kind of think about in the next three, six months? Because children who don't have access to technology or you know, their families don't are going to lose out, right? And then you're gonna put them at a significant disadvantage again. Yeah. So again, yeah. Yeah, so first, look, I think it's Madhav said it in the beginning, um, you know, it's a very, very tough year. I, I don't think whatever we can try pushing links to people's text messages and um, giving them YouTube links or whatever else. I mean, TV, interactive radio, I think systems should try everything. But it's no substitute for children being back in school. I mean, there is no new normal here. I mean, we, we need to go back to the old normal. And so I think the single biggest thing on the school side we can do is think intelligently about how you reopen schools. What data should system be using at the district level to reopen schools? Doing it too early is bad. Doing it too late, you know, there's a huge cost attached to it. I think people often forget the cost in terms of children falling behind and that inequity increasing. So I think thinking hard about that school reopening how does it happen? Not just the protocols, but when do you do it? I think the protocols are simpler uh, to figure out, right? I think it's, it's going to be critical. On this issue of access in higher ed, I mean, my own belief is the, the system should just move to one where there's greater financial aid for those who need it. I mean, at the IITs, for instance, I, I would personally, I know there's huge resistance, raise the fees uh, further, 
but ensure that people from disadvantaged backgrounds still pay next to nothing to go there. I mean, why should we be subsidizing the IIT and who then goes to work in banking or goes to the US and goes on to get a master's in computer science, then goes and works for a tech company? Why should we be subsidizing? In fact, those people should be paying for these institutions. These institutions can be built up and we should have some financial aid kind of package. So I think that model of differential pricing we haven't really had in our public system and it needs to be introduced into the public system as well. Madhav, do you have anything to add? Uh... I mean, there's always something to add, but do you have, <laughs> do you have time? It's 9.25. Yeah. No, I, I, I think uh, I'll just add another point, which uh, is not something that comes from what you just said, but uh, we are talking about technology as though it is going to be the engine, you know, the, 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 the really the silver bullet. I don't think that is true. Uh, we have to make the child keep the focus on the child and make it child centric rather than technology centric. Earlier it was teacher centric. Now we are making it technology centric and saying that the technology will take the place of the teacher. And underlying in all this, a lot of people are talking about how technology is going to be fantastic and all that. And they forget that the schools have to reopen and there are going to be 3 million teachers who will need their jobs. Are we saying this school is not going to work? If nothing else, there are 3 million people who will need the jobs. And what, what are you proposing to do? So how is their role going to change? How is the schooling going to change? How is the, so I think the whole idea is to create access. Now we could play with new models with the technology to create access. For example, if you think about uh, simple things like digital library, and I'm not talking about creating, you know, putting monitors in a classroom, but a digital library where people can borrow devices and have access to internet is possible. And economically also it is possible if you really think about it. So uh, as uh, Ashish said in one of the things we pointed out earlier, is there's a lot of experimentation that is required and we must create space for that experimentation. Right now, that is not there. And whatever experimentation is there is people are doing free for all. But, you know, scientific experimentation, which says that this is the way to do it. This is what needs to be uh, done and achieved. And measurement around those experiments is something that's important. So there's always a lot to talk about. Yeah, and I think we just have three minutes, but I want to end with asking you the one question, right? So in the next thing, 10 years, what is the one thing that gives you hope and the one thing that makes you despair? both of you, like just one thing each. I think for me, the one thing that gives me hope is that this, if we were to take this 55% learning poverty, children at age 10 who can't read, that I think we'll get it down to 15% in the next 10 years. So that's what gives me hope. And that will be the single biggest accomplishment of this nation, because it'll, it'll create the foundation. If we want a, eventually a $20 trillion economy, we better get this right. Um, so to me, that, that's the single biggest one. I think the, the despair uh, comes from the fact that sometimes we, we try to do too many things. Uh, so uh, it's just that, you know, and sometimes there isn't good data. Uh, and so if we are really committed to honestly making this happen, we, have, we need prioritization and we need to measure well uh, and be dogged about it. It requires militant execution. We can't be boiling the ocean if we want to make this happen. And it needs a, a sort of a big tent approach where many people are coming together. The system, the parents, the children, the teachers, civil society. And that coordination obviously is very, very difficult. Uh, so those are the challenges. Madhav? You ask me, uh, the hope and the optimism stems from the fact that we have actually, again, started focusing on foundational skills. Let me not uh, expand on that. Ashish has already said that. The despair comes from uh, our obsession with the upper uh, levels and not looking at the foundations. Although it has been talked about, the danger is that we will actually not pay so much attention to it because uh, it's it's the whole attitude. It's about 10 standard results. It's about 12 standard results. It's about the toppers. It's about the cream of the society. And if we lose focus on that, this will be a huge opportunity lost forever. We already lost a lot of years uh, of the uh, so-called demographic dividend. And it's turning out to be a demographic disaster. It's moving there. And this is the last call. If we don't do that, 
uh, and it's the danger is that we may not actually get there, uh, then we are done in forever. Great. Uh, we've just made it in time. So thank you so much, Madhav. Thank you, Ashish. There were a bunch of other questions, but obviously we didn't have enough time for this. Um, yeah, thank you for this great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anaj.